We're going to try. We're going to try and make a start. If we have a few uh, latecomers, they can sort of they can join us midstream. Uh, thank you all. It's very good to see you. Thank you all for coming, and I'd like to welcome uh, Alastair Gibson, uh, who's going to give us a bit of a bit of a, a chat on veterinary cardiology. Um, so, without further ado, we'll just hand over to Alistair and uh, let him okay. let him work away. Um, thank you very much. <laughs> well, firstly, thank you very much for inviting me in today, or this evening rather. Uh, it's nice to see a few familiar faces here we haven't seen for a while, and uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, Robert asked me a couple of weeks ago to do this, and um, I was kind of thinking what I would do. I've done a couple of talks for the club before, and we've, I suppose in those we've talked very much about sort of specific cardiology things that affect cavaliers, and I, I was sort of thinking about this, and I suppose what I started to think was that the one thing we, we really mustn't forget is that although we've got our own breeds and we, we very much sort of are involved with those and those breeds are you know known for certain things obviously in Cavaliers we've got the mitral valve disease issue and we can talk about that later on but at the bottom at the end of the day rather I suppose they are still dogs with hearts and they suffer from heart disease and you know heart disease is heart disease no matter what breed you are um, so really what I would like to do is uh, to talk through a wee bit I suppose really about the sort of work I do um, and I've got a few illustrations, they're all involving cavaliers, um, some of them actually belonging to people in this room. Um, and uh, I say just to illustrate the types of problems that, that dogs can get, in particular cavaliers, uh, and what we can now do for them. I suppose one of the privileges of being involved in veterinary cardiology, and indeed I'm sure the human cardiologists would say the same thing, is that the field of cardiology has just, oh, exponentially grown in the last 15-20 years. The types of things that we can do now, the types of things that we can offer uh, compared to whenever I first qualified. I qualified quite some time ago. I was trying to work it out the other day there and um, it's a long time ago, um, <coughs> back in the, in the 80s. Uh, but whenever I first qualified, I can remember that essentially we had three tablets to treat heart disease. We could take x-rays, nobody had ECG machines, uh, we could take x-rays of a dog's heart, we didn't have ultrasound, we didn't have all these other fancy things that we can do. Um, and we had three tablets. We had a white tablet, we had a red tablet, and we had a buff tablet. Um, the buff tablet was a drug called Dijoxin, which some of you might have heard of and some of you might be on. Uh, I'm on it myself, believe it or not. Um, <laughs> the other one was a, a water tablet, a diuretic tablet, frisamide. And the other one was a little red tablet called Melophiline. I don't know whether anybody ever had a dog in Melophiline. And melophilin was essentially just a caffeine tablet. That's probably the best way to describe it. Didn't really do an awful lot of good, but it was. It looked good. It was red. It was a different colour. So that, was, <laughs> that was why we sort of uh, we used to use that. But really, the, the bottom line was the only drug that really did an awful lot for these animals was the diuretic. Put little cavaliers coming in, and I, I can remember uh, again whenever I was young, we had our own cavalier, a wee guy called Roly. And uh, as with so many of them, he suffered from mitral valve disease and went through all the stages and progressions. And uh, again, as I say, my father being a vet, he would have treated him and taken him in to, to dry him out, as he called it. You know, took him into the, the, the surgery and sort of gave him diuretics to clear out the fluid every so often. And uh, that was really all that we could do for him in those days. Um, nowadays it's changed and there's a whole array of different drugs and medications, some very, very potent medications now. So hopefully we can do a lot more. And the other big thing is that we can now do a lot more as far as surgery and interventions and treating electrical disturbances in the heart and also in diagnosing these things. So this is, this is more of an overview. As I say, there will be examples of Cavaliers in this. Uh, if anybody wants to ask more specific questions about Cavaliers later on, then I'm happy to try to answer, obviously. Uh, but initially we're going to sort of talk through what, what can be offered in the field of veterinary cardiology. So I hope this remote is going to work. Let's see if it will. Sometimes it takes a second to, aha. So starting off with a very basic slide there, just, just what are we trying to do in treating heart disease? And, and this slide will be the same, whether it's me giving this talk or your human cardiologist giving the, the same talk uh, regarding uh, human patients. So what we're trying to do is, heart disease causes symptoms. We're trying to alleviate, we're trying to lessen those symptoms. Our big thing is to try to improve quality of life. I think that's one thing that we really have been able to do something about in the last 10 or 15 years. Partly because of the advent of a couple of drugs in particular, and we'll come back to those in a second or two. 
And then the third thing is to increase longevity. But, but at the same time, there's no point in increasing longevity of a patient unless you have some sort of quality of life. So those two things are very, very uh, much tied together. Uh, and uh, we aim to do both. So how do we treat heart failure? We've already touched a wee bit on uh, how we did it in the old days and the, and the treatments that we had available. And essentially it's the same treatments, but we have a lot more drugs available uh, and some new families of drugs as well, which uh, really do help matters. At the top there, uh, if we look at medical treatment first of all, we've, we've still got our diuretics, our water tablets, very, very high up on that list. And those are drugs which are a, a cornerstone of treating heart disease. One of the problems with heart disease is, or heart failure, is that fluid builds up in the body. That fluid can be in the abdomen, it can be in the chest, in particular, in heart cases, it tends to be fluid building up in the lungs. And unless we can clear that fluid, I mean, these animals are going to have very severely compromised lifestyles uh, in the same way that human patients would have. The second one on the list there, vasodilators, these, as I'm sure you maybe are aware, many of us will be on them here, I'm sure, because these are drugs that are used a lot for blood pressure issues. Uh, these are drugs which open up our blood vessels, make it easier for the heart to push blood through the, the blood vessels. It's a simple, simple plumbing uh, equation in that if you have a narrow bore plumbing system, it's harder to push blood through that. There's more pressure, more work involved. If you can open up the size of the, the plumbing system, as it were, uh, fluid mechanics is such that it's easier for that flow through, in this case of blood, through the vessels in question. So anything that dilates the vessels makes it easier for the blood to go through, takes the workload off a failing heart. The third one there, that's a, a, a term that uh, you maybe aren't aware of, or some of you might not be aware of, inotropes. Inotropes are more particularly what are called positive inotropes, are drugs that strengthen the heartbeat, drugs that make the heartbeat stronger. I mentioned digoxin earlier on. Digoxin is a very, very old drug. It's a drug that's been around for hundreds of years. Uh, in fact, some people say it was used back in Egyptian times. It's a drug that comes from the foxglove plant. And uh, anybody here on digoxin? Just out of interest, no? Usually whenever I give these talks, at least one, well, I suppose I am on it, so that's, that's <laughs> how <laughs> that sort of fits in. But digoxin is a, a positive inotrope. It strengthens the heartbeat. It does other things as well. It actually fits into this last category too which are anti-arrhythmics. These are drugs which um, alter the heart rhythm. And oftentimes in heart disease, one of the main problems that you tend to face is that the heart rhythm goes skew with. Robert, you've had examples of that, or you know about that. I know about it too. We both were comparing our pacemaker and defibrillator. <laughs> um, so as I say, that's, that's a very common issue in, in human and in canine patients. Going back up to inotropes, or drugs that strengthen the heartbeat, Anybody here of a dog, I'm almost sure you're going to say yes, a dog on vet medin? Yeah? yeah? So vet medin has been one of the, the, the really big things that's happened over the last 15 years. Um, and I, I can remember, I mean this is going back probably, oh, 1999, 18, 98, 99, 2000, when I, I was actually involved in the early sort of work that was done on the drug. It was one of the centres that was trialling it. And um, it just was amazing the, the, the way that these animals were responding to this, because prior to that, we just didn't have drugs that really made a huge difference. Um, and certainly metamedin is a drug that has, has made a major difference as far as treatment of heart disease in uh, Cavaliers in particular, but most other breeds as well, is concerned. Um, so it, it tends to be called the wonder drug. It very quickly became known as the wonder drug in veterinary cardiology circles. Um, I can remember, this is again going back a lot of years ago, going over and doing a, a sort of a sabbatical over one of the universities in, um, in Canada. And at that time they didn't have vet medicine license for use in Canada. We were lucky in Europe, we had a wee bit earlier. And they didn't have it over there. And um, they referred to, they weren't allowed to talk about the drug because it was all sort of double blinded and everything. But they were doing all these trials in this drug. And uh, again, they called it the wonder drug. And it really is, I mean, it's, it's, it's not too much of a, a leap to, uh, to call it that. But again, we'll, we'll sort of talk more about that later on. The other thing that's really come on in the last few years is surgical treatment of heart disease. Um, again, if you look at valvular disease in people, we take valvular disease in our cavaliers uh, and other smaller breed dogs. Um, if in the human context you have that sort of problem, the options previously would have been to treat it medically, or more importantly, to go in and actually to replace a valve. Nowadays, valves tend not to be replaced as much. If you replace a valve, in a human patient, there can be issues with uh, clotting, with, with clots forming, and that can be a big thing to try to control. 
So nowadays what tends to happen is that they don't actually replace your valve in most instances, they repair your valve. They actually go in and repair the, the damaged valve, cut away the disease portion, stitch it back together again in a way that makes it more efficient and uh, it's still your valve, it's not you can foreign material in there that is going to maybe create clots or, or cause clotting problems. That's less commonly done in, in dogs. It is done. There are centres in, in both in London, Japan, America, where they're doing this sort of open heart surgery. The problem is cost. And the problem with any sort of valve replacement or valve repair surgery is you need a whole huge team of people to do that sort of thing. Um, it's major, major undertaking and there's major cost involved. A friend of mine actually is, is one of the surgeons in London who, who does that sort of open heart surgery on valve disease. And I mean, you're talking maybe 15, 20,000 pounds. So it's way beyond what any insurance policy will cover. Um, yeah, interestingly, I was speaking to him just the other week there. And he was saying he had three dogs brought in in the previous six months for heart, you know, heart operations like that. All three of them were brought in in private helicopters. <laughs> so that's, that's, that's sort of the, that's the, that's the sort of the area that you have to be in. But there's people out there doing these things. I, I can remember another time, actually, um, it wasn't a cavalier, but I can remember a, a very nice chap brought this working collie dog into me. This is about oh, three years ago, four years ago. And um, it, had a, it had a congenital narrowing of one of its heart vessels. And uh, it wasn't his dog. He was training the dog for a, a, for a Russian guy. <clears throat> and uh, I said, if this dog needs this surgery, is it insured? Oh, no, it's not insured. Um, you know, it's, it's a big operation. You could be talking, you know, a couple of thousand, three thousand pounds to fix it. That, that should be okay. So the next thing was, I got a phone call from this guy saying, uh, Mr. Oligarenko or whatever his name was, would like you to do the operation. Would you be prepared to fly to Cannes in France or possibly the Ukraine to do the operation? He will fly you over. But I was thinking, what the heck's going on here? And it turned out he was one of these sort of oligarch types mm -hmm. and I said like I can't because you know you need special equipment you need a special x-ray machine a moving x-ray machine he will buy that for you <laughs> <laughs> and I said well, this, this thing's like sort of you know 60 70 80 thousand pounds he will buy it for you but anyway I, the bottom line was the dog didn't really need the operation so I managed to talk him out of it but I was probably stupid uh, all, I have a anaesthetist friend that helps with a lot of the surgery that I do and he was good on, you know, quick, see if he can get a team of us to go over and we'll, we'll have a holiday in, uh, in Russia or whatever. So, uh, as I say, there's a, there's a move away in human medicine now from replacing valves to repairing valves. One of the things that is interesting is that nowadays uh, what they can also do, what can be done, is that you can repair valves of the heart without actually opening up the heart. So many things nowadays, we're going to talk about some of these things in a minute or two, so many of these things can now be done through access of a vein or an artery or whatever it might be, but you're not actually having to go in to, to cut open a chest. And this is amazing because it means that the recovery time from these things is so much quicker, so much shorter. Um, and a lot of the work I would do fits into this lowest category here, it's called interventional surgery. So a lot of the sort of the valve operations I do, maybe not repairing valves, but actually sort of if there's a narrowed valve, we'll talk about this later, that needs to be opened up, I will do this by sort of balloon catheter or by something through the vein. Um, and I, 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 it's again, it's such a, a simpler thing for the animal to go through. Not necessarily technically that much simpler, but it's a lot simpler for the animal. And the other thing that I'm doing more and more of now, instead of actually opening up chests to sort of operate in hearts, a lot of what I would now do actually happens through this thor thoracoscopic surgery. And thoracoscopic surgery is keyhole surgery. And in the same way that if we go for operations now, so many of these things are now done via a keyhole approach. Uh, where you're not actually getting cut open, you're just getting little tiny chokers put in or ports put in. And in abdominal surgery, uh, I, I do a bit of abdominal surgery by keyhole, but obviously my main interest is the heart. So most of what I do is, is thoracoscopic surgery. And I must admit, I'm really sold on this because previously operations where I would have had a dog in that maybe was going to be hospitalised for, oh, I don't know, maybe a, a week or 10 days after a surgery with a big open chest wound that's been closed over. Nowadays, these dogs, 20 minutes after their surgery, they're up and they're, you know, they're really bouncing around and looking very, very fresh. So there really is a big difference in the way these, uh, these operations can be done. I don't know if this is going to work, but if you look over on the right, I hope nobody's squeamish. Uh, this is a, a, an operation to remove fluid from around a dog's heart. So we're actually inside the dog's chest. You can see where I'm working with a pair of scissors here. 
And all I'm really doing is just creating a little window in this sac around the heart. It's called the pericardium. And the fluid is inside, inside that sac. So I'm just cutting away, it's only a very short clip, but I'm actually cutting away a little window. Again, through two tiny little holes that wouldn't be much thicker than my, my fingers uh, to create a little window. So a very short clip, and I'm obviously not showing them all the operation. But again, these animals were before, they would have taken a long time to get over that sort of thing and make a really speedy recovery. Uh, a lot of equipment involved, not the cheapest thing to do, it tends to be insured animals mainly, but uh, at least the option is there. So, diagnosing heart disease, because obviously until we make a diagnosis, and a good diagnosis, we can't really decide what treatment plan we want to follow. And although there's all this fancy equipment nowadays, ultrasound machines and ECGs, whatever else it might be, uh, the first thing you need to do, and everybody needs to do, is to do a full clinical examination. And this is me showing you sort of a stethoscope being used. And, and, and I think both in human medicine and in veterinary medicine, the stethoscope, because of all these other techniques that students come out of college nowadays, be they medical or veterinary students, and they want to use all these fancy bits of kit. And in a way, this is a dying art, which is a shame because the stethoscope, if you go back to sort of the clinicians from, oh, 30, 40 years ago, and these guys and women were, were trained to have such acute diagnostic skills with their ears and with a stethoscope, they could actually more or less tell you what was wrong in many instances. Well, maybe not definitively, but they could be 90 or 80 percent sure uh, what the diagnosis was simply by using a stethoscope. So as I say, it's certainly a, a skill that, that's a wee bit of a dying art to some extent, but a very, very worthwhile skill to, uh, to learn. Uh, and uh, one of the things I always tell vet students whenever they come out is buy themselves a, a good quality stethoscope uh, which they can actually hear something with. So it's still worth doing. Radiographs have been around an awfully long time. Uh, this is a very big heart in a dog. That's actually a cavalier. A great big dilated heart. The heart should fill about a third. of This is the chest wall here. And there's the heart. The heart should fill about a third of the width of the chest. And you can see here this is obviously bigger than it should be. It's filling about two thirds. So uh, a big heart there, and x-rays, again, cornerstone. One of the reasons we take x-rays, x-rays are the only way that we can truly diagnose, other than by listening and hearing a funny sound with our stethoscope, if there's fluid on the lung. Ultrasound doesn't show you that, ECGs don't show you that. The only way you can be sure there's fluid on the lung is by x-ray. So it's still very, very important, even though this is a technique that's been around for oh, a long, long time now, it's still very important to take x-rays. ECGs, most veterinary practices now have ECGs. Uh, some of them are very good at diagnosing from them, other people maybe don't bother to sort of learn too much about it, but we'll, we'll fax on the ECG to somebody that you know, specialises in that. I've got a lot of ECGs sent through to me from, from different folk. That actually just reminds me I was supposed to reply to somebody about an ECG today and didn't, so that's, that's useful. Um, but what we're really looking for here is mainly odd rhythms in the heart. The heartbeat is normally a nice, steady, regular pattern, lub dub, lub dub, lub dub. We can have fast heartbeats, fast heart rhythms, we can have irregular fast heart rhythms, we can have slow heart rhythms, uh, as treated, uh, I think you were saying, Robert, that was what your problem was, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, mine would be more, I have a defibrillator thing in, and mine's more of a sort of a fast heartbeat problem that I have. So uh, again, the ECG is the way that we diagnose these things in the first instance. We can tell other things as well from it. We can look into uh, how well drugs are working, drugs that we're using to treat these problems. Uh, we can monitor anaesthetics very carefully by, by keeping the animal uh, attached up onto an ECG. And in human medicine, it's a very important way that we diagnose heart attacks. Myocardial ischemia is the, the technical term for that, or medical term for that. Not quite so important in dogs because they don't tend to get heart attacks to the same extent that that people do, but uh, it still can happen. And then the big difference in diagnosing heart disease, the thing that's really made a big difference is echocardiography, Doppler ultrasound. Uh, out of interest, many people here have had a dog that's had a cardiac ultrasound done. Well, Doppler is sort of a, a type of, 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 yeah, but even just an ordinary ultrasound. Well, yeah. Yeah. So, there's a few, <laughs> so there's a few of you, but, but it's, it's, again, most vets now have got some form of ultrasound in the clinic. Um, how well they're sort of trained up to actually do heart scans, it varies widely, but I mean, most people are very upfront about that, and if they're not confident in doing it, 
they will you know send you to somebody that, that, that does do that sort of thing but this really has been the thing that's made the biggest difference as far as actually making a diagnosis and actually allowing us to put a name onto the problem not only that not only can we make a diagnosis but we can quantify the problem we can actually look to see how much of a problem there is uh, and that's important too because obviously that's very much tied in with uh, prognosis if we look at mitral valve disease in cavaliers and other smaller breeds Again, one of the beauties of this is that we can assess how it's progressing. We all know that it's a progressive, gradually progressive uh, condition. And with the, uh, with the equipment that we have, we can actually work out how quickly it's progressing. Do we need to add in more medication? If so, how much? What medications would be best indicated? All those sorts of things. And as somebody mentioned at the bottom, uh, there are different types of, of echocardiography. There's simple what's called 2D echocardiography, two-dimensional echocardiography, which just lets us see the heart structures, lets us see them moving. And then we've also got Doppler echocardiography, and this is the sort of Doppler picture that we get in many cases here. These little spikes are telling me uh, what speed blood is flowing out in the heart, uh, what direction it's going in. It's a bit like a police radar catching you doing 40 and a 30 zone or whatever, which happened to me not that long ago in the upper Newton Arch Road. Uh, but, uh, <coughs> You'd be glad to hear I went and did that course. Hands up, who's done the course? Yeah. <laughs> I tell you, it's, 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 yesterday, yeah? It's, it's getting scary. And, and the other thing was, whenever I went and did that blasted did course, no, dead right, but I went and did the course in the Stormont Hotel. Um, so you did it, yeah? So I was in the Pete's Hall. Oh, well. But, but there was about 40 or 50 of us there, and I think it was. I think it was like 90% had all been caught in the upper Newton Arch Road in this fixed camera, which I didn't know anything about until I got caught on it. So anybody that doesn't know about it, careful driving up the upper Newton Arch Road. Just, just a quick fit, it's just sitting on the... So if you're up there, watch out. But um, what were you doing? 73 and 60. Apparently I've been like one more, I would have blocked. Is that right? I was, doing, I was doing 36 and a 30. I got 41 and 30, yeah. and I got the point. Yeah. 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 So I don't. So it's the same technology. So I was going to just chat for a wee while about uh, mitral valve disease. And again, apologies for the, the slightly gory picture, but this is a dog's heart valve opened up. And again, I know you're not maybe used to looking at heart valves, but can you see these big pearly nodules here? There, 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 there there and there. Those are meant to be there. Uh, those are, are a substance called collagen, which is degenerated because of a, an inbuilt uh, genetic mechanism that we get in our breed, um, and have created these little pearly nodules which have actually caused the valve to contract. Can everybody see this okay? Do you want to show yeah. the lights down a bit? If, if you're struggling to see or if the video clips aren't too obvious, give us a shout and uh, we, can, we can turn them out for a second or two. And this is an x-ray of uh, a dog with a similar degree of mitral valve disease. And can you see this great big bump up here? Mm -hmm. It almost looks like a tumour or something, but it's not a tumour. That is the top left chamber of the dog's heart, the left atrium. And the left atrium is the chamber which is being leaked back into whenever the mitral valve is uh, diseased. And again, this is stuff that I'm sure you've all uh, read about and know about. So this is very, very big in this dog. This left atrium is massive because of leakage. So if you do see that, you can be fairly sure there's going to be a leaky mitral valve in this dog. You listen with your stethoscope, you'll hear a very obvious murmur in these dogs as well, usually by this stage. So mitral valve disease, as you're well aware, commonly seen in small breed dogs, especially cavaliers, but many, many other breeds as well. We occasionally see it in larger breeds too, not so commonly, but we do see it. And I've mentioned a few of the more commonly seen breeds with the problem. But it's, it's, you know, it's fairly rare. Um, in most cases, it's middle-aged, older dogs, with the somewhat exception of cavaliers, who tend to start their progression that wee bit earlier uh, because of, again, genetic reasons. And in general, statistically speaking, males tend to be more overrepresented than females, but not always. Let's see how this to work here. So I mentioned at the outset that this disease is, is gradually progressive. Although sometimes the clinical signs develop very suddenly. Does anybody know why that is? That you can have a very chronic disease and yet you can have a sudden onset of signs? I would, can be, very much so, yeah. yeah. But there, there's a, a more, I suppose there's a more um, intrinsic sort of reason in that 
whenever the heart starts to struggle, whenever the heart knows that it's struggling, as you know, uh, Barbara, there, there are mechanisms which come into play, which it can actually perform, it can work harder, it can beat faster, it can do different things to try to compensate, it can be changes in blood pressure, all these things to try to compensate for the problems that are built in uh, or, or that occur because of the, the disease process. So what can happen is that up to a certain point, the disease is gradually getting worse, okay? The heart's compensating for these problems, one by one, bringing in these reinforcements, as it were, trying to sort of overcome the problem, or reach the problems that are, that are occurring. And up to a certain point, it does that really, really well. The heart's amazing. It's an amazing organ that does this really well. But it only does it really well up to a certain point. And it is at that point that it's just saying, sorry, folks, I just can't cope with this anymore. It's the last straw that breaks the camel's back, as it were. And that's why you can have a very chronic, gradual disease process, but it can actually be quite a sudden onset in some cases. Not always. Uh, usually you do see a sort of a, a, a progression of symptoms. But sometimes it can be very, very sudden, and that's the reason why. So the first thing we tend to find, I'm sure you've all experienced this, is whenever you go into the vet for annual booster or whatever it might be, um, nails click or whatever and a stethoscope is stuck to, stuck onto the chest and a murmur is found in your three-year-old, four-year-old dog or, or whatever else it might be. Uh, that usually is the first sign and that, that murmur usually precedes uh, the development of, of symptoms in most cases. As far as the initial symptoms are concerned, the subtle things you're looking out for, maybe a wee bit of exercise and tolerance, the dog just doesn't want to walk or isn't able to walk as well or as far as it did before with the same vigour. A little cough. Well, we all know the, the classic cough that you tend to associate with heart disease, that sort of... Because uh, <coughs> if you're trying to get something up. Um, and that's simply because there's fluid there. There's two main reasons for the cough. One is fluid on the lung, but there's another reason as well. And the other reason is, remember that picture I showed you with the big left atrium? And the left atrium, that chamber of the heart, sits right beside where the windpipe divides into two, into what are called the main stem bronchi. And these are narrow or quite thin walled. And in the same way that if I was to take a finger and press in your windpipe, <coughs> you're going to cough. The same pressure, the same feeling is occurring deep inside these little dogs' chests. And that's why they can develop a cough, sometimes in the absence of actual fluid being there. Tachypnea means fast breathing. And that's the other subtle thing that you'll often see is that the dogs actually start to have a faster resting respiratory rate. Normal respiratory rate in the dog, depending on what they're doing, is 10 to 25 breaths per minute. So if you notice that your dog is sitting, the room's not too warm, it's lying in front of the TV, you're watching TV, it's not overheated. And Does that like panting? Well, it doesn't have to be panting, it just is the actual rate that they're breathing at. So it could be, it could be that they're panting, but, but oftentimes it's not, it's just the speed at which they're breathing. So, I mean, for instance, whenever I'm treating heart disease in, in dogs, a lot of Cavalier owners, whenever they go home, I will train them, as it were, to, to count respiratory rates in the dogs at rest at home. And because a lot of these dogs have got issues with fluid building up in the chest, I will actually get the owners to self-medicate to some extent. Well, not quite self-medicate, but to alter medication on the basis of how the dogs are breathing. So if you go home and the dog's on diuretics, it's on frizomite, water tablets to get rid of that fluid, and you have it in one 120 milligram tablet twice a day, and you think it's not coughing anymore, but the breathing rate has gone up. You see it just sort of lifting, and you count the respiratory rate whenever it's at rest, and it's 30 breaths a minute or 33 breaths a minute, 35, whatever it might be you can then push up the dosage a wee bit of your diuretic. Again, obviously consult with your, your vet. Do that in conjunction and with your vet. Well, normal, normal mm -hmm. respiratory rate would be somewhere between 10 and 25, usually. So anything over, anything over 30 is excessive, or tends to be excessive. There are other reasons why they can do that. If they're in a really warm room, or if they've just come in from a long oh, walk, you know, you take those things into account, that, that stands to reason. But if those things are all equal and, and you know, it shouldn't be sort of having any other reason for doing it, if it's over 30 then it's oh, there's something going on there that's struggling to breathe. And usually the reason for that is a wee bit of fluid in the lung. Oftentimes associated with a cough, but not, not always. So we go on with our clinical examination. We're looking for this harsh sounding heart murmur. That's a very characteristic harsh 
sound to it that we get. Uh, I don't know whether any of you have ever had a chance to listen with a stethoscope to your dog's heart murmurs. But in cavaliers, what you tend to find is this sort of this, this sort of sound. It's like a so it's a real harsh, rasping murmur that you get. Other murmurs in the very early stage of the disease tend to be a wee bit softer, maybe. Uh, sometimes in the very late stages of the disease, you can get very musical murmurs. Uh, whenever they've really progressed, and sometimes the things like cordite tendon eye rupture, uh, the, wee, the wee strands that hold the valve in position, oftentimes those dogs don't do very well, but sometimes you'll hear like a very musical sounding murmur, and you get weird sort of whooping sound. I can remember, I think you had one, Heather, one time with a whoop, uh, and I always wanted to record it with my wee recording, but I never, never it. it was like a whoop, 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 whoop. It's a weird sound.